Hello and welcome to ABA Made Easy. I'm Mauricio and today we'll be covering the first section of the RBT exam, A measurement. All right, I hear you loud and clear. You want a little crash course on this RBT exam. I got you. So today we're going to be talking about measurement. But if you haven't seen the previous video on the requirements you need for the RBT exam and some study tips, I highly, highly recommend you watch that before watching this one. So before we hop into it, I just want you to know that I've made more in-depth videos that go into detail uh, with all this terminology. And I'm going to let you know when I've made a video like that. Um, so if you want extra practice or extra examples, you can go to those videos. Uh, for a more in-depth discussion. But this is supposed to be a very quick, fast review. You listen to it while you're going to sleep because you like hearing my soothing voice type of thing. All right, so let's get into it. A1, prepare for data collection. Now this is pretty simple. You're gonna have maybe one question on this or two. Basically, just be ready to work, okay? So how do you get ready to work? Before each session, you should have all your materials prepped. What does that mean? You have your tablet, your phone charged, ready to take data on those devices if you're using it. If you're using data sheets, you have all your data sheets ready. And you have to know exactly what you're going to target during the session. So you have to look at the data from the session before and see which behaviors you're going to target. You also want to make sure you know how to run every procedure you need to run to tackle these behaviors. Now, if you have something risky like elopement where the kid is running into traffic, you know, that is going to take priority and you have to know which objectives you have to prioritize. So that's important. Aside from having your devices fully charged, some other things you have to have ready to go are your flashcards. If you need flashcards, if you're going to do something like matching or um, tact training, having your reinforcers ready to go and on hand, and any other devices you need for taking data like counters or timers or anything like that. So basically have all your materials ready, know exactly which behaviors you're going to target because you read the data from yesterday, and uh, know all the procedures you need to run these programs. All right, A2, and I might look down here from time to time because my notes are here. Um, implement continuous measurement procedures. What is that? Okay, continuous measurement. Just think about this like, oh, you're continually measuring, so you're gonna get every single behavior, okay? And that'll make it easier to remember which ones are continuous versus discontinuous. And this one you're getting every instance of the behavior. So these include frequency, rate, duration, latency, and inter-response time. And for the exam, it's not enough just to know the definition. You should also know what type of measurement is best for each behavior. If you want a more in-depth review of these terms, um, click here or here. There should be something popping up right now. I don't know. Pretty sure it's there. So frequency or count is basically you record every time the behavior occurs. So you can use a tally mark, you can use a counter. Um, basically every time the behavior occurs, you count it. The behaviors that are best for this are behaviors that are short, have a very obvious beginning and end, like clapping, biting, punching, jumping, you get it. Rate is just like frequency, but even better. It's how much it's occurring per time. Why is this better? Because it becomes consistent based on how often it's occurring per time. So even if the sessions are longer or shorter, you have the same kind of scale. So if you have a session that's twice as long, you would expect twice as many problem behaviors, right? And that doesn't mean that it's increasing, it just means that the session was twice as long, so you're gonna have twice as many behaviors. So I think rate is a little better than frequency. Then you have duration. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's how long a behavior occurs. The time 
elapse between the onset and the offset of the behavior. So this one, make sure you have a very clear beginning and end. Latency is how long it takes a child to respond to your instruction, okay? Basically, that's when it's usually used. But if you want to be very technical about it, or more general, it's the time between the onset of the stimulus to the initiation of the response. Then you have intra-response time, or IRT, because behavior analysts like letters a lot, so they shorten everything just to sound cool. IRT is the time between two successive responses. So you'd want to use this in something like sips of juice or bites of food. If they're taking five minutes between every bite of food, you would want to shorten it. But if they are drinking sips of water every half second, you might want to slow it down. So you could use it to prolong or make shorter. But basically, it's the change of time between successive responses, IRT. Now A3, implement discontinuous measurement procedures. All right, we talked about continuous, which is you're measuring every single behavior. The discontinuous is just the intervals and momentary time sampling. That's it. Instead of getting every single behavior that occurred during a session, you're getting a sample of what has occurred during the session. So let's talk about the intervals first. Intervals is basically um, pieces of time. If you have a one hour session and you want to split it up into six intervals, you have six 10 minute intervals. So intervals are just sections of time. Then you have whole interval recording, which means that the whole interval, the behavior has to be occurring for it to count, okay? So you got, let's say, studying, which you define as someone looking at their book and has a pencil in hand. That's how you define studying in this example. So they have to be on task for the whole 10 minutes for it to count, and you check it off. It's like, okay, the whole first interval, they, they were on task. If they did like, let's say eight minutes, which was close to 10 minutes, but not the whole 10 minutes, it doesn't count, it counts as zero. So then you wait for the next interval to start. And then once the next interval starts, then you see if they were on task for the whole 10 minutes. And that's whole interval recording. You have to be engaged the whole entire time. And this is good if you want to increase behavior. Partial interval recording is using the same intervals as you had before, but instead of them being engaged the whole time in the interval, they are engaged at some point in the interval. So let's say it's talking, saying a word, right? The first 10 minutes, um, they didn't say anything, so it doesn't count at all. The second interval, they started talking, they talked a bit, so it counts. Let's say you talked 25 times in that second interval, it just gets one check mark for that second interval. If they talked one time during that second interval, still just one check mark. And partial interval is good if you want to decrease behavior. Momentary time sampling, which is one I didn't actually go into in the last video, uh, but it's pretty important, is when you choose a specific time, let's say three o'clock, and you check to see if that behavior was occurring at that time. If it is occurring at three o'clock, you check it off. If it's not occurring at three o'clock, no checks. So when is this useful? If you're a teacher and you have 30 students, this is awesome. So this is good for big groups when you're sampling big groups because you can take a snapshot at three o'clock and see how many people are, let's say, focused on their task. So useful for big groups and that's what they're gonna ask you on the exam. A4, implement permanent product recording procedures. Okay, permanent product. What is it? It's a permanent product. Okay, so basically anything that you can see after the behavior occurred. This could be holes in the wall, after punches. This can be a completed assignment, um, like homework or an exam after they completed it because the behavior is that they wrote down and you can measure it by seeing that they actually did the assignment. So to have a good permanent product, it has to be that that permanent product is only caused by the behavior you're trying to measure, okay? 
So if you are measuring holes on the wall, uh, you better make sure that the only thing causing holes in the wall is uh, someone punching the walls and not some goat that's just ramming into the walls. All right, next section. We're almost done. Two more sections. All right, enter data and update graphs, okay? So basically, um, discrete trial training is when you're sitting at the table with them and you're running the session. That's what people think of when they think of ABA, okay? Um, while you're doing this, you're supposed to be taking discrete trial data on discrete trial data sheets, okay? So just know that and you do this every session. And then, at the end of the session, you wanna make sure you put those data into summary sheet. And then, a summary graph. And that's basically it. You wanna make sure you have the data and you have it summarized for the month. Um, that way, next session, you're prepared by looking at yesterday's data. And at the end of the month, you see a big snapshot of how everything's going. And it's super useful for your supervisor. All right, last section, let's go. A6, describe behavior and environment in observable and measurable terms. What does this mean? Operational definition. I already alluded to it earlier, but basically, so important, you have to define a behavior very well, okay? You can't measure someone being upset, okay? Because if you measure, if you put upset, that's gonna mean different things to different people. And if you have different technicians on the case, they're all gonna measure it differently and it's not gonna work out. So you want a very specific definition that you can observe, okay? So for upset, it could be throwing themselves on the floor and crying and this behavior ends when they're not on the floor for two minutes and not crying and it has to be that specific um, because if you don't make it that specific if they stand up like at one minute and then fall down and cry again um, someone could count that as two tantrums but actually you're counting it as one because your definition said that they have to be standing up for two minutes so tips for operational definition Make it as clear as possible of what you can observe and make sure you specify when the onset is and when the offset is. And the way you know you got a really good definition is with inter-observer agreement or IOA because letters. Basically that's when two people measure the behavior either by looking at a video footage of it or both being in the same room and secretly marking and if they get i think it's over 80 percent agreeance that's a good definition all right we did it we did section a we're doing good how do you feel doing good you're gonna do great okay next video is gonna be assessment that one's gonna be a little longer but we got this so that's it for this video if you found it useful at all, uh, drop a like down below. Helps me boost up in the YouTube algorithm. I know I always say this, but it's true. It's just how the world works now. We're controlled by machines. Um, subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I'll catch you in the next one.